Pastor Carter, welcome back to our program. Fresh Thank hot you. potatoes from our viewers. Mm -hmm. Questions for us to answer, especially curly ones. We like those. Mm -hmm. We welcome you to our program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's uh, talk about the Bible. Uh, there are questions on the translations of the Bible. Uh, over such a period of time, people start to distrust the new modern translations. Mm -hmm. Some are paraphrases. Uh, the question that is sent in by Sylvia, an email from Australia, mm -hmm. is which is the best Bible translation to use? There's so much confusion, she says. Mm. Good question, Sylvia. Uh, it was Sylvia, wasn't it? It was yeah. Sylvia from yeah. Australia. Yeah. Thank you, Sylvia. I love, personally, the King James Version. Uh, I've memorized much of it, you know. Who hath believed our report and to whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? Yes. Isaiah 53. Um, it was translated, of course, in the 1600s, a mm -hmm. uh, long time ago, 400 years ago. Yes. And therefore, some of the expressions are rather quaint and uh, they're really out of date. Okay. That is why we need new translations. Uh, the new King James Version has tried to improve the old King James Version, mm -hmm. but hasn't done so. It has improved the meaning, but it has lost much of the beauty yeah. and the glory of the King James Version. Um, the most important thing is to read the Bible, whatever the translation. Our problem today is that we don't take time for the reading of Scripture. Yeah. I read from mainly from the New International Version. Uh, I think that's an excellent translation, the NIV. Uh, this Bible is just about worn out. Uh, then you have the New American translation. It's very good. Yes. Uh, most of the translations are good. Uh, you should stay away from paraphrases. Yes, yes. Or interpretations. Now, with that being contentious, <laughs> one church uses the clear word. Yes. But it's not the word at all. It's a it's a commentary. Yes. I've spoken to the author who was a very godly, good scholar, and he never wrote it in the way that people use it. Yes, yes. It's a commentary on scripture. It's more than a paraphrase. Yes. But we should not use it for doctrine. We should not use it for serious Bible study. Yes. For our devotions, it's fine. Yes. But you need to get a good translation like the NIV. New American Standard Bible, and there are others. And it's hard to beat the old King James Version. Yes. It's fine. Yes. But you should get a, a, a translation that is a translation, yes. not a paraphrase. Yes, exactly. And, and there's a flow-on question from a, another uh, person here from India. Mm -hmm. I, I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Uh, Shantanu. An Shantanu? Email Shantanu. Uh -huh. An email from uh, India. Uh, Shantanu says... What is the difference between thou and you in the Bible? Uh -huh. Should thou or you be used? I understand that thou is a harsh word used in the old English language. Uh, please explain. This flows on from our last question. Thou was the way people spoke in the days of, the, of King James. Mm -hmm. It's Victorian English. Yes. Uh, Queen Victoria. Uh, Queen Elizabeth. Queen, Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth, rather. Yes. Uh, the Elizabethan age, the age of Shakespeare. Yes. It was all these and thous. Yes. Uh, we don't speak this way today. If those people were living today, they would say you yes. and yours yes. and so forth. And so modern speech translations do not use the language of 400 years ago. Yes. They use the language of today as it should be. And isn't that what Jesus himself That's what did. Jesus did. Yes, yes. Uh, Jesus spoke in the language of his day. Yes. He didn't speak in the language of hundreds of years BC. Yes, yes. Uh, now let's go back to the Word. We have another uh, Bible text type question. It hmm. uh, comes from Boris, an email again from the computer, the internet. How do you explain Colossians 2, 16 and 17? Can we look that up? Yes. Colossians. Colossians 2. Uh, chapter 2, uh -huh. verses 16 and 17, an email from Boris asking about uh, your opinion on this Bible text, Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Yeah, uh, Boris uh, is worrying about this. I can understand this, Boris, okay. because this text is used to prove 
that the seventh day Sabbath is ab- abolished. Ah, uh-huh. okay. So this is the text that is brought out to say uh, the Ten Commandments are really done away with, uh-huh. especially the fourth one. Now, let me read this. Let's hear it. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Now, the Bible says here, don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. Now, Pastor James, listen to this one. That which proves too much proves nothing at all. Okay. Ah, that which proves too much proves nothing at all. If this text does away with the Sabbath, it also, my friend, does away with eating and drinking. Okay. Well, do you believe in eating and drinking? Yes. And now, it wasn't Boris who asked this question? It was Boris, yeah. yes, yes. And Boris, do you believe in eating and drinking? Oh, yes, you do. Of course you do. Well, then you've got no reason to give up the Sabbath. What it is talking about is the system of man-made traditions that governed these things. Yes. Now, I think I can get a text here. Okay. In the same chapter, uh, verse 8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceitful philosophy which depends on human tradition and uh, the basic principles of this world uh, rather than on Christ. Back in these days, there were influences that came into the church, human influences. Some of them were based upon Gnosticism. And they came and they perverted eating and drinking. They perverted the commandments of God and they perverted the keeping of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. The great Dr. Samuel Bakayoki takes the same viewpoint in his book From Sabbath to Sunday. And he points out and he shows, yes, the Sabbath is mentioned here, but the Sabbath in the context of human traditions. Yes, Yes, yes. The human traditions, our blessed Lord, did away with. Yes. He had nothing, no time at all for human tradition. So he abolished human tradition, but Jesus went on eating and drinking and keeping the commandments of God and observing the seventh day Sabbath. And he certainly did. Mm. And look, I have another question from Aaron, which is along the same lines. Yes. Uh, f- follow mm. me on this. It's a little mm. lengthy, but I'll ask it. Um, I have heard the gospel and have, have the conviction of the Holy Spirit that I am a sinner and need a saviour. Mm. I confessed all my sins, asked Jesus to forgive my sins, come into my life to be Lord of my life. Mm. I'm now born again, Aaron mm. says. Mm. I have experienced God's power in my life and have completely turned from sin and I'm serving mm. the Lord, I'm not afraid to die, he says. Mm. Um, I know my name, name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, but yeah. I'm attending services on Sunday and not Saturday. Am I lost in sin? Mm. Will I not go to heaven? Is Sabbath keeping a must to be saved? I thought everything uh, is is symbols and types of Jesus, which is the the true reality. Yes. I came to him and I found rest for my soul. Is he not the Sabbath of the Lord? I thought that the spirit, Mm. heart, core Mm. or center of the Sabbath is rest Mm. and that rest is Jesus. Am I wrong? Uh, Aaron uh, asks. Aaron. Yes. Uh, That's not a question. That's a commentary. (laughs) That That is is a commentary. It's an excellent commentary. (laughs) But it flows well into the last question. Aaron, there's a little saying, I would not work my soul to save, for this my Lord hath done, but I would work like any slave for the love of God's dear Son. Yes. I am not saved by my works, but I am not saved without works. Mm -hmm. I am saved by faith alone, but a faith that is never alone. Yes. I am not saved... By faith, by just, I am saved only by faith. Yes, only by faith. Only by faith, but the faith that saves me is demonstrated by works. Yes. The faith that James says this: the faith that saves me is demonstrated by works, or else it is a false faith. Yes. Now, Aaron, I don't doubt your Christian experience, not for one moment. 
You've come to Christ. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Are you lost? No, 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 no. But there's a text in the Bible in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. It says, if we walk in the light, God gives us light. Yes. You may not be baptized, but one day God is going to show you the truth about baptism. And you're going to walk in the light and you're going to get baptized. And he's going to show other truths to you also. Even though you are saved, he wants you to keep walking in the light of God's word. And remember this, Jesus is our Lord, our Savior, and our example. Yes, yes. And Jesus was a Sabbath keeper. Yes. The Apostle Paul was a, was a Sabbath keeper. Yes. All the apostles were Sabbath keepers. All the Bible writers were Sabbath keepers. Did they do this in a legalistic way to earn salvation? No, but because they loved Christ and because the Sabbath represented the gospel, they kept the Sabbath as a demonstration of their faith in Christ. Yes. And as we said some time ago, Pastor James, yes. the Sabbath is the rest day. Genesis 2, 1 to 3. It is the rest day. That makes it the blessed day. The Bible says that God blessed the seventh day. Yes. That makes it the best day. But all the way through the Holy Scriptures, the Sabbath is, wait for it, a test day. Yes. It was a test day in the days of Jesus. It was a test in the Old Testament. Yes. It was a test in the days of Moses. It is a test in these last days. And the Bible says, if Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Very good answer. Very good answer to a very good question. Very good question. We are going to come back with more questions yes. in just a moment, but we'll do that after this important message. And welcome back to our fresh hot potatoes program uh, with Pastor John Carter in the kitchen. Mm. If uh, we're cooking potatoes, you're the cook. <laughs> We've got you in the hot seat and we have some wonderful questions coming in from our viewers and from our friends on the internet, the email, and we, and we love to receive these questions. I, ha I have an interesting question uh, for mm. you. Mm. It's a little bit different, but I think it'll speak to a lot of our viewers out there. Uh, it's from Vanessa. She writes, I read in the Bible that our spirit goes to God when we die and an animal spirit goes to the earth. What does that mean? And what do you think God will do with all the many animals that have died? I think we might need to grab that in two parts. Uh, I yeah. think so. Uh, Vanessa, when it says the spirit returns to God, it is re referring to this vital life force that God has placed within us. That goes back to God. But I've got a text here that uh, it's, it's a thoughtful text, so I'm going to read it to you. It's out of uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, this text talks about the breath of animals and uh, the breath of man. Let me, give me a moment to find it. E Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 21 says, Who knows if the spirit of man rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. So that's where she's getting it from. Yeah, yes. but it doesn't say what she's thinking. Yes, yes. It says, Who knows if the spirit of man rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. Mm. Now, it doesn't say it does go down to the earth. No, it doesn't no. say that. No. Um, God has placed in every creature the breath of life. Uh, in fact, the term nefesh kayar, which means a living soul, yes. is used in the book of Genesis, Genesis 1, not only for human beings. Mm -hmm. It's used for the whales in the ocean. Yes. The great sea creatures have got, they are, they have a nephish kayar. Yeah, breath of life. Yeah, uh, well, they're, they're living souls. Yes, living souls. Now, when a person dies, the Bible says, the breath of life, this life force, this intangible thing, yes. goes back to Almighty God. And the person sleeps in the grave until the resurrection. And then when Jesus comes, the dead are raised, immortal and glorious, never to die again. Yes. You see? Yes. Now, so we are assured concerning the, the resurrection of God's people. Yes. Now, I can't tell people what the Bible doesn't tell us. Yes. We're not told in the Bible about animals. Now, if I can't find a text in the Bible that says your pet poodle is going to be re resurrected, yes. but I can find a text that tells me that God loves people. 
the Bible tells me that our Father is full of an inexpressible love. It is so great. Uh, it is incomprehensible. And God loves you. Vanessa, he loves you with all his heart. I think Pastor James, um, I'm just thinking here. I think our God is so great and our God is so good that if this would enhance the well-being and the joy of his children in heaven, I think he would give them that which would help in that area. Okay. Maybe a pet. Can I give you a text? Yeah, will there, will there be animals in heaven? I mean, that, there will be that animals. That may be yes. Vanessa's main concern. Yes. Yeah, you know. uh, Vanessa, it's going to be like it was in the Garden of Eden. Yes. But there won't be a chance of sin coming in. It's mm-hmm. going to be indescribably glorious. Yes. And there will be animals there and they won't be eating each other or us. Yes, yes. Mm. Now, uh, that is a great question. There are not a lot of animal lovers, but we're going to go a little yes. deeper. Uh, we have an email from Matt. Uh, he says, the mass. What is your take on the mass that Catholics celebrate each week slash day? The mass is not a satanic ritual like some claim. Mm-hmm. The mass is not a repeat of the sacrifice that Christ once offered. The mass is to us like the Passover is to the Jewish people. The Passover is a memorial feast. Um, so so <clears throat> to, to us, it's a memorial feast, uh, the Mass. And then he goes on, that sacrifice is made present in the Last Supper. This is uh, uh, speaking that the ma- he's basically saying that the yes. Mass to them is a memorial. Yes. It's a long question, but that's essentially what And his what name is saying. Matt. His name is Matt, and he's asking about Matt. the Mass. Great question, Matt. Great question. However, Matt, you don't understand the theology of your own church. Pardon my telling you this. Because in Roman Catholic theology, the Mass is more than a memorial. The Roman Catholic Church has a system of priests and every priest must offer a sacrifice. Yes. That's what the priesthood is about. I'm a minister, I'm not a priest. I don't offer a sacrifice. Mm. But the Pope and his legions of priests believe that they are intercessors and they offer a sacrifice to God. Mm-hmm. In Roman Catholic theology, the Mass is a sacrifice and Christ is offered up a thousand times on the altars of Rome. Yes. It is called an unbloodied sacrifice. Uh, the doctrine of transubstantiation, Pastor yes. James, that yes. you know about, it teaches that the, the bread is actually turned into the body of Christ and the wine is turned into the blood of Christ. That's yes. the doctrine of transubstantiation. Yes. Where do I get this from? This is Roman Catholic theology. Roman Catholics believe it is more. Well, those at least who are skilled in the teachings of the Catholic Church. Yes. Perhaps the vast majority of Roman Catholics are not aware of this. But the Bible teaches that the Lord's Supper is a memorial. Yes. We have the Lord's Supper. We don't have the Mass because the Mass is a sacrifice. Let me read to you what the Bible says. And this is the book of Hebrews that talks about the priesthood of the Old Testament. And there are no priests in the New Testament. No 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 priest. There is one priest, Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm. Does the church need a priest today? Yes, Mm -hmm. Jesus. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ Once for all. Yes. Once for all. Hebrews 10 verse 14, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. One sacrifice. Yes. The concept of extra sacrifices goes against Holy Scripture. It is wrong. It is blasphemous. Now, Matt is not aware of these things, Pastor James, Mm -hmm. but he needs to check with his priest or better still with the catechism. Check with a good catechism. The mass is a sacrifice. Yes, yes. But there's only one. It happened 2,000 years ago on Calvary. Yes. 
Good answer and good question from Thank Matt. Thank you. Thank you. I have another very good question. I'm this glad you passed me on that one. Oh, look, uh, <laughs> I'm glad you answered it, not me. Uh, now, um, this is a question mm. from from uh, Margie, or, or Ma Margie would be the name. Or Margie. Uh, or Margie. Uh -huh. uh, hers is a little long, but it's a good question too. Yeah. It says here um, about Seventh Day Adventists. Mm -hmm. She says that. Uh, but the Adventist gospel is so different from the biblical gospel. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy to spot. But the basis of the biblical gospel is what God does on the cross. That's good. And she says that the basis Margie. for the Adventist gospel is, what, uh, is, is about the second coming. Do you think, she says, that SDAs will be, ever, uh, will, will be willing ever to rethink their gospel <laughs> and go back to the Bible alone and the cross. Uh, God bless you, Margie. I have some good news for you. Here it is. Uh, Pastor Vanegas, I have no doubt that there are Adventists who've got it wrong on the gospel. Yes. I've got no doubt. I've met them. I've met plenty of Baptists who've got it wrong too. Mm -hmm. And Methodists and Presbyterians and Lutherans and Anglicans. Yes. I've met many, many people in many, many churches who've got it wrong on the gospel. But the Adventist church does not teach what Margie is saying. Yes. I've been an Adventist pastor, as I say in Australia, for donkey's years. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, for many years. <laughs> That's for a long, long time. I know what the church, the Adventist church, officially teaches. Yes. It may not be what every Adventist preacher preaches. Yes. It may not be what everybody in the church pew believes, but I don't care. I'm not talking about that. Yes. We believe, the Adventist church believes that I am saved by Christ alone. Mm -hmm. The Adventist church teaches that on the cross, Christ made an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world yes. once for all. We do believe that we are saved by works. Christ's works. Yes. We are not saved by our works because our works are continually polluted by sin. Yes, yes. We are saved by the work of Christ in our place. Yes. We believe that we are justified by faith. We do not believe that justification makes us righteous. Yes, yes. Now some Seventh-day Adventists may believe that. And, and preach it. And preach it. Yes. And some Pentecostals believe it too. Yes. And preach it. But this is not what we really believe. Yes. They may preach it in certain parts of the world more than in other parts of the world. We believe, you can read this in our, in our statements of faith, justification is a declaration from God yes. that declares that the sinner on the basis of Christ's merits is declared righteous. Yes. Justification is a declaration, not a making. The making is from the Council of Trent. Yes. But after a person has been declared righteous, the Holy Spirit gets inside him and starts to make him into a new person and then starts to actually make him righteous. Yes. Makes him into a new person. Yes. So the gospel that I believe is the gospel that Billy Graham has taught. It is the gospel that was taught by great Christians like Alan White. Yes. HMS Richards, George Vanderman, George Vanderman, one of my dear friends, and I could go on and on and on. So don't judge Margie, mm -hmm. the Adventist church, by the statements of a few heretics in our midst. So in summary, uh, the cross is central. The yes. reconciliation that Christ did for us, his life, death and resurrection, mm -hmm. that is the gospel. Yes. But we must say too, the second coming is the fulfillment of that, the culmination. The, the, the second, you know. We only have a few minutes left. so There's we, not we much just... hope for us if we believe only in the cross and don't believe in the coming of the Lord. Yes. So that is the culmination of what yes, it Christ is. did on the cross. And that's why we teach it. And Pastor Carter, we thank you again for reminding thank us you. of the basis of the true gospel and for being with us. And we thank you also for watching the program. Again, we invite you to send your questions in carterreport.org.org. It's very easy to find. Please leave us your questions and we'll endeavor to answer them. Thank you for watching and God bless you.